So I'm Ben Pruden with Whereabouts. Really appreciate you all joining. I lead our go-to-market efforts here. Um, I'm joined by Sean. Hey, uh, I'm Sean Knight with UZ Data. And we're here in person in our San Francisco office. We figured it'd be fun to actually sit next to each other in real life uh, at, while we talk to you all today. So hopefully you appreciate that. And we certainly do. <laughs> um, but yeah, we're going to be talking a little bit about um, winning the talk of wars with data and how to use Whereabouts Cloud uh, to uh, drive time isochrones and H3 to evaluate market cannibalization and competition. Um, so maybe with no further ado, Sean, well, let's just get into it, shall we? Yeah, um, let's kick it off. Uh, so, oops. We'll do a quick uh, agenda here. So um, we're going to do a quick intro of what Yuzu data is. Uh, Ben's going to tell us a little bit about Whereabots. Uh, and then we're going to do a very brief review of cannibalization and competition studies in retail and commercial real estate. Many of you probably are familiar with these, so we'll keep it brief. Uh, and then we'll jump into a live Whereabots Cloud notebook. Uh, and we'll do a demo where we walk through an analysis that my team at Yuzu Data has put together, uh, where we are conducting cannibalization and competition studies between two prominent taco chains in uh, the Texas area. Uh, so we'll be talking about uh, using Overture Maps data, identifying points of interest, generating trade areas, and drive time isochrones, uh, estimating the cannibalization and competition potential. Uh, and then uh, actually Ben has uh, a little bit he can tell us about understanding the business implications of location intelligence. Um, and then at the end, we'll do an interactive Q&A. So going off script for a second there, why did, why did we choose taco chains? Because it's fun and delicious. Because you like tacos. I like yeah. tacos. It's fun because I'm from Texas originally, just so you know. And I've, I had, know I've, had, I've had both torchies and velvet tacos many times. So. Yeah. Winning. I also just thought it was funny because uh, when you're talking about a market competition study or market cannibalization, you have to sort of assume that there's an upper limit that the market can tolerate of your product, mm. right? Like you only need to buy, a population only needs to buy so many groceries. And it's kind of funny with tacos because arguably there may not be an upper limit to the number of tacos people can eat. So <laughs> we'll, we'll kind of see. My waistline might might beg to differ, but we'll see. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we can jump into it here. Uh, I'll just introduce... Um, a couple of items here. So I know this is a bunch of the motivation behind forming Whereabots. Uh, these issues come up a lot in Yuzu data as well. Um, essentially, there, there are a handful of inconvenient truths about location data and working with location data. Uh, there's the expertise challenges. So doing any kind of geospatial analytics on location data usually requires a special skill set that is not available to normal data scientists or is not trained in normal data scientists, is not uh, generally found in data teams. Uh, there's complexity. Uh, geospatial challenges are hard to solve in general, but actually even harder to solve at scale. Um, and then there's <laughs> legacy lock-in, of course, uh, where there is a, a lot of products that have historically been around that run locally, run in um, relatively structured environments where you, you cannot scale them easily. Um, and then lacking modern data architecture. So many companies have been moving to cloud data warehouses, lake house solutions, uh, but those solutions are not optimized with location data in mind. And so there are challenges if you're trying to work with location data in those environments. I know this is a big part of what Whereabots does right. is solving that problem. Uh, and then one that I'll just add here is that um, as a aside, that these issues are especially true in commercial real estate and retail. Uh, I've talk to many people in this space. And the thing that I keep hearing is that they generally have a very small under-resourced data team that is generating one-off reports and analyses for, as in some cases, thousands of brokers and stakeholders across the organization, uh, which is a, a big challenge. And uh, adding any sort of scalability to that has to help. So um, I'll do a quick uh, introduction to Yuzu Data. So we are AI and location intelligence for commercial real estate. Uh, our sort of tagline that I enjoy is that we help companies leverage AI and data science to avoid, uh, avoid becoming dinosaurs. And there's kind of a funny story behind how I got that tagline. I was on a call with someone and uh, she was in the commercial real estate space. She had reached out to me. She was curious about what we do, what solutions we provide. And I asked, hey, why did you reach out? You know, what, what made you think to reach out to us? And she said, well, I've been hearing so much about, you know, location data and AI and all these things happening. And I'm really worried that, that we're going to become a dinosaur, my company. And so, of course, after I got off that call, I immediately went to my website and changed the text to say, we help companies leverage AI and data science to avoid becoming dinosaurs. So uh, hopefully she's not on this webinar because that would be kind of embarrassing. But there we are. That's the truth of it. 
Uh, what we do in practice is we do boutique consulting and services uh, around geospatial data. Uh, we build custom solutions, leveraging AI, machine learning, and geospatial analytics for commercial real estate. We do custom data products. Um, so a lot of data is sold as sort of raw ingredients. We try to get it close to being uh, maybe not delivery, but uh, a, a at-home meal kit where you can put it into the places it needs to be and get the results out right away. And we, of course, help clients implement wearabots and get maximum ROI from that when they don't have the sort of skills team or, or necessary infrastructure in-house to get off the ground with that. Um, and then I'll kick it over to Ben for... Yeah, just Whereabouts. a quick overview of Whereabouts. So um, I'll start with just the, our history with Apache Sedona. Um, so Apache Sedona has been around since uh, 2017. Uh, it's really the underpinning of our technology as a company. And, and ultimately what we're build, like, building is built on top of um, the history of Sedona. So I'll just do a quick overview of that. Um, so you know, originally I started off, um, you know, really focused on, on distributed spatial joins. Um, and, we, you know, we built a number of optimizations that the team did behind Sedona around that added spatial sql uh, to that uh, 2018 2019 then added the, the python AP, uh, api as well uh, and then really continued to mature that and as, as that as that set of things um materialized our growth really accelerated uh, and then from that actually around 2021 into going into 2022 uh, we graduated from being um, a, a small open source project called geospark to becoming uh, our apache project uh, we were an incubating project uh, 2022 into 2023, um, and then graduated as an actual uh, Apache project. Um, and from there, we really continue to see a lot of acceleration, in particular with the advent of GeoParquet and supporting GeoParquet format. Now it's a very popular format for sharing geospatial files for data science uh, and, and analytics. Um, we had a debt raster data management uh, for Spark, uh, and then additional geography operation support now today in Sedona, you can uh, analyze and, and run over 200 different uh, geospatial operations across, uh, you know, spatial and geometry joins, um, as well as other operations for raster data as well that we've added um, alongside that. So that kind of brings us to to Whereabouts as a company. So we're, we're basically building a serverless managed Apache Sedona to make it really easy to up, get up and running. Um, if you haven't done this, if you're not familiar, you can go to whereabouts.com, create a trial or user account. And we have a, we have a free tier that you can take advantage of. Um, but once you do that, you can you can start getting a, a feel for the experience. And so, first of all, at the the underpinnings of it is our spatial data catalog. If you didn't know this, we're actually members of the Overture Maps Foundation. Uh, we actually recently just joined, just announced that I think uh, last week. Uh, but we've been using Overture data for a number of years, or, or well, basically since it's been available. <laughs> um, Within Whereabouts, and um, and it's you know a great foundational data set, and alongside many other data sets that we make available in our spatial catalog, uh, we want to make it very easy for you to connect your uh, first party data to that spatial data catalog. You can connect directly to S3 or to other data sources like Databricks or Snowflake. Uh, you can take advantage of our Whereabouts DB. Uh, Whereabouts DB is really an optimized, um, very uh, efficient version of of Apache Sedona with some additional capabilities. Uh, we've we've added Habasu, uh, which is a geospatially aware uh, table architecture built on top of Iceberg. Um, the open source team behind Whereabouts is also contributing and working to contribute Iceberg and our Habasu extensions to Iceberg back to the Iceberg community. It hasn't fully been accepted yet, but we're working on it. Uh, we do want to ultimately have that very lake house friendly architecture that works to and from them from that uh, natively. Uh, and then a number of things we've added, uh, you know, since our inception as a company, one is our spatial notebook, notebook uh, capabilities. That, that's majority of what we'll be talking through as we're going through the demo today, looking at that. Um, the ability to run spatial jobs in Airflow, uh, as well as directly within the Whereabouts uh, UI. Um, so if you have regular recurring jobs or job triggers that you want to run, uh, those spatial jobs are really easy to run. And then ultimately, our, our uh, in addition to that, our spatial SQL API, as well as our Python DB drivers, uh, and capability to connect, um, you know, to your favorite CLI. We actually just uh, started um, making available, and we're hardening right now an integration with Apache Superset with that Python DB drive, uh, uh, Python DB API, as well. And then lastly, I'll wrap up. I kind of I'll circle back around to it. Our Whereabouts AI capabilities, um, so that in particular is includes our our raster inference capabilities. Uh, the ability to do uh, inference on raster imagery or, or satellite imagery, 
um, as well as map matching and a number of other algorithms that we're building around geostatistics uh, to make it really easy to, to, to run those geostats and whereabouts cloud very efficiently in a distributed fashion. Yeah. I'm just going to say, Ben, you mentioned the Apache superset integration. Mm -hmm. um, rumor has it we have a more that we can talk about that or maybe something that we can show about that at the end of this. Yeah, we, we can uh, we could definitely show a quick kind of like slide like slide through view of it, but we can, um, we can definitely do that yeah, for, we, for a minute. We have some time at the end. Yeah, exactly. There you go. Um, great. Okay. Um, well, let's jump to the next one here. Sure. And uh, I'll start talking about cannibalization and competition studies. So uh, there are sort of two sorts of studies here that we're actually talking about, and we are combining them into one process. Um, there's what's called traditional cannibalization. That's where you have a number of stores and you are trying to see if your stores are stealing business from your other stores. Uh, so a good example of this is the image on the right here. Um, th these are actually Starbucks locations. Coffee shops do not actually cannibalize each other quite the same way. As everyone knows, you can have two Starbucks across the street from each other and have lines out the door, both of them. Uh, but um, in other businesses, you will want to make sure that you are not competing for the same customer base with your existing stores, especially relevant for franchises, where they usually have contractual agreements to make sure that franchise operators are not competing with other franchise operators for the same customer base. Uh, and then we have direct competition or what some people even call market cannibalization. This is where a market has a limited capacity and uh, two brands with very similar products are essentially eating into the same market. Um, so again, that goes back to the old, uh, can you eat too many tacos thing? Well, probably, but um, <laughs> if, if that would, that would more affect the direct competition or market cannibalization case. Uh, at user data, we like to put these two studies together um, because we think they have sort of complementary insights. So if you are suffering from traditional cannibalization among your stores, you probably have less market impact. And so you're also more susceptible to direct competition from your competitors uh, or market cannibalization. Okay, uh, so we'll just jump ahead here. Um, we are going to be using drive time isochrones for this analysis. Um, there are many different ways to define trade areas for a store. Uh, so let's pretend we have two stores here um, in San Francisco. And if we were to do a sort of two mile radius buffer, a very common way to do a trade area, uh, we would see significant overlap between these stores. This is a very traditional way of doing this. Uh, however, if we were to look at actual drive times, say how far someone can drive in 10 minutes, um, which tells you the area in the area from which customers can get to your store within 10 minutes, uh, we actually see a pretty different picture here. So we would see that of these, uh, when you do the 10 minute drive time, because if you know San Francisco, we've got the freeway here, we've got Market Street uh, down here, those kind of slow down and, and limit how far you can go. There's actually very little overlap in these two trade areas between these stores. It's actually interesting because it's, it's, it's Mission Street in particular that like, the isochrone doesn't seem to go past, which yeah. I always find it like there's traffic always between mission and market and getting on either side of mission market is if you're coming from the from the south going up north over the other side of market, it's just a pain. So I, like this plays very true to reality. Yeah. And I suspect it's also sort of a three prong thing here where we have mission, we have market, and then we also have the um, the freeway here right. to get around. Um, and so what's happening is it's slowing down or limiting the distance that they can make with that isochrone, even though it is not the exact perimeter. Um, so, um, oh, we'll jump into the uh, business impact here. I'll hand it over to Ben real quick. Yeah, sure. I want to do that one first, and then we'll jump into the demo. Yeah, well, I think maybe, maybe it makes sense to come back to it at the end of it. Let's, uh, let's come back to it. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Um, we can talk through it once we get, get through the demo, if that's all right. Yeah, yeah. So let's jump into the demo here. Uh, I'm going to change what tab I am sharing. We've got Ben's computer there, so I can verify that you guys are seeing what I want you to see. Perfect. And uh, yeah, let's just walk through it here. So this is the demo notebook. Uh, we can make this available to anyone who wants to go through this analysis that, uh, themselves. Um, we limited the region, even though Whereabots can process this nationally very easily. We limited it to the Texas region so that any free users who want to test it out can run it on the uh, free tier um, without any issues or slowdowns. Um, so let's jump into it. Uh, so we talked already about retail cannibalization and competition studies. We don't really need to rehash that one. Uh, so we are jumping in. And I will say off the bat, this code notebook combines Python node, 
uh, Python code, spatial SQL, and uh, um, a little bit of regular SQL. Uh, so just be warned, there's a bit of code here. Uh, so these are the import statements. Anyone with Python knows we need to do those. And then right here, what we're doing is this is the first step. We're saying, okay, let's say you have, um, you're looking at restaurant locations in Texas, Torchy's Tacos, Velvet Tacos. Well, we need to know the locations or the POI data, point of interest data uh, for those stores. So what we're doing is we're querying the Overture Maps data, and we're actually using the Wearabots spatial data catalog that Ben had mentioned earlier, uh, where it already has the Overture data loaded. Uh, so we can actually just say Sedona table. Uh, you're going to see a lot of Apache Sedona references. That's uh, essentially Wearabots um, leveraging Apache Sedona. Uh, so we can just say Sedona table. We can pull that in and we can call that table places. And then we can go ahead and process this uh, query to grab the data that we want. And we're going to grab uh, all of those where the name is like Torchy's Tacos or Velvet Tacos. So. Uh, we'll pop down here, and here's just a preview of what that table looks like. Uh, Torchy's Tacos and Velvet Tacos are both in here. We get the latitude, longitude, uh, and then we also get the geometry here, which will be useful. And we can quickly throw it into the Sedona Kepler uh, create map function and just glance at it here to make sure it makes sense. Everyone familiar with GIS, geospatial mapping, knows that Best practice is always to look at your data and maps as much as possible and make sure it's doing what you think it's doing. So we can see we've got the yellow or the Velvet Taco locations, the blue or the Torchies. And of these Texas markets, it looks like Dallas is probably the, the densest with both. Uh, so we'll scroll on down. Now what we want to do is we want to grab those drive time isochrones uh, that we had shown in the slides. So I've got a couple of Python helper functions here. Uh, these are essentially just wrappers to make it easier to grab that data from the Valhalla API. Uh, it's through, uh, I believe Valhalla is part of OpenStreetMaps, um, but we don't need to go through that line by line. We'll just say those are there. Um, essentially, it's just making the API calls simpler. And here is the code. Now, if you're running this yourself, you're gonna wanna uncomment these three blocks and run those to actually generate the isochrones. However, it's a free API and I didn't want to tax them over and over and over again as I was testing this out, preparing for this webinar and whatnot. So I actually just went ahead and saved it after calling it the first time. And so I'm just loading it here. And you can also see an example of how easy it is to uh, read in uh, some saved data with Wearabots. Uh, so then we'll go ahead and map that as well. And we've got the isochrones here, uh, already zoomed in in the Dallas area, but we've got them for all of them there. Um, but uh, you can see we've got some overlapping isochrones, uh, drive times. We've also got some that are overlapping for multiple of the same store. Uh, so again, Velvet Taco here is yellow, and then in the blue is the Torchy's Tacos. So that's a, a little bit of a qualitative analysis. Uh, now what we want to do is say, OK, well, can we make this more quantitative? Can we get some structured results out of this analysis um, that we can put in slides, describe, um, pass along to leadership and whatnot? So, to do that, I think what we're going to need to do is grab some population data. We've got a population data set here uh, that is in H3 hexagons at resolution 8. And uh, what we're doing is we're just reading that in. Then we can take a look at that data here. These are the H3 hexagon indexes. So those tell us where they are, um, but uh, not very human readable, but that's OK. And then the population counts for those individual ones. So each one of these hexagons is about 0.2 miles, something like that, I believe, at resolution 8. And then we can scroll on down here and we'll see, uh, we're going to go ahead and calculate the trade area hexes. Uh, so what we're doing is we are taking those trade area polygons or those drive time polygons, these ones here. And for each one, we're essentially filling it with these H3 hexagons so that we can match it up with the population data. Uh, so we go ahead and do that here. And now we've got uh, many, many of these H3 hexes. Uh, with the store locations. Uh, I'm only showing Torchy's Tacos here simply because it's only showing a handful, but there are Velvet Tacos in this list as well. And then the populations for those. Uh, and then what we can do is separate out the two. So we can just do a quick, uh, if the name is like Torchy's, let's separate it out into a Torchy's Tacos uh, data frame. And if the name is like Velvet, we can grab a Velvet Tacos data frame. Then we can do the actual cannibalization now. So that was all essentially prep work. Uh, but once we've done all the prep work, the next step is super simple. Uh, we just say, okay, well, 
we want to know uh, all of the hexes that overlap with more than one trade area. Uh, and we want to enrich those with the population stats. So we're just doing a little group by operation. And we've got all the ones that have more than one. Uh, so essentially, that would mean that there are overlapping polygons or overlapping trade areas. And these are just Torchy's Tacos at this point. So we're saying there's Torchy's Tacos location here. There's Torchy's Tacos location here. Their drive times overlap. So they're essentially competing for the same customer base. And we'll pop down there. Uh, I'll jump into what how this figure looks in a minute. Uh, we've got the results here at the bottom. Uh, and then we're just doing another query here to get the uh, total possible population for everyone within a Torchy's Tacos drive time. Okay. So here are the results. I decided to just summarize them here and throw it in purple to make it easy to find. Uh, so what we determined from this is the there are roughly 1.5 million people in Texas that live within a five-minute drive of at least one Torchy's Tacos location. Those drive time isochrones were five minutes. Uh, of course, you can adjust those depending on what you know about your business and your trade area. We figured tacos, probably five minutes makes sense. Uh, of those, so of those 1.5 million people, there are a about 97,000 who live within a five minute drive time of more than one Torchy's Tacos location. So they they live within a five minute drive time of two or three Torchy's Tacos locations. So those are the customer base or potential customer base that we would say may be getting cannibalized. Uh, so we do a little quick math and we can say that the Torchy's Tacos locations near each other in Texas cannibalize as much as 6.3% of their potential customer base. So that's sort of our cannibalization metric there. Um, and then I think I mentioned this a little bit, but if you adjust the trade area or how you calculate the trade area, all of these figures will adjust. So if you're doing a uh, buffered radius, it'll look different. If you are doing a larger drive time, or if you have thorough customer data and you know where your customers live and you can uh, create a trade area based on that, you're gonna get different results. But with Wearabots, it's pretty quick to change that and then just reprocess all of this. Uh, just run all cells and it'll do it again. Uh, okay, so Velvet Taco cannibalization, we're essentially doing the same thing. I'll be a little bit less detailed here since it's the exact same process. Uh, we just uh, run the same thing, use the group by, uh, run the SQL function to get all of the population. And we have, uh, now I will mention Velvet Taco has fewer locations than Torchy's Tacos. So they also have fewer people within their five minute drive time. They have about 750,000 as opposed to Torchy's Tacos, I believe 1.5 million. And of those 750,000, uh, they are also seeing about 97,000 people who are within a drive time of two or more. Uh, so what we're getting is, nope, actually that figure is incorrect. So let me check this real quick and make sure. Yeah, no, they're seeing 100,000. So I'll correct that later. Uh, they're seeing 100,000 um, who are in the range of one or more. Uh, Velvet Taco locations. So that means that they're cannibalizing as much as 13.4% of their potential customer base. So that's their sort of cannibalization metric there. Okay, we know how many they're cannibalizing of their own stores. Uh, what about each other? We even see, if we go all the way back up to that first plot, we can see that where you see a, in many cases, a Torchy's Taco location, you're also seeing a Velvet Taco, right? They tend to be pretty close together in a lot of cases. Uh, so I expect the competition or market cannibalization to be relatively high. Uh, so once again, with Wearabots, we can just run one quick query here and get our uh, H3 hexagons, uh, the count where they are in more than one um, hexagon or trade area between the two populations, and then the populations of those. And again, we'll get the total possible population and put all of that into our results frame here. So we can just say... Oh, nope, I'm looking at the wrong one. There we are. Um, <laughs> okay, this is our final SQL uh, query here. We'll just do trade area hexes and get the uh, population sum. And we'll say roughly 400,000 people in Texas live within a five minute drive of both a Velvet Tacos location and a Torchy's Tacos location. Um, so if you think about the uh, total population of possible Velvet Taco customers, and do a little bit of math, you'll see that about 53% of their potential customer base also live within five minutes of a Torchy's Tacos. So that's a relatively high uh, competition score or market cannibalization score. 
Now, Torchy's Tacos is less subject to that because they have more locations. So they are directly competing with Velvet Taco for as much as 26% of their potential customer base. So that would mean 26% of their customers live within five minutes of both a Velvet Tacos and a Torchy's Tacos. Uh, that is a lot of tacos. Okay, uh, that is it for the demo. Let's jump back over to uh, the slides here. Awesome. And let's actually have... You want to go back to slide 13? Yeah, we'll let's go ahead and do that one. Here. So this is very specific to commercial real estate teams. And, and really what we wanted to articulate was a couple of different things. First of all, um, that it, it's not always easy to, to communicate the business value of this type of analysis at scale. So we wanted to make it kind of a, a guide on how to do that. Um, I've, I've spent a lot of time working with various different business value analysis uh, methods, um, worked a lot with the Forrester um, Total Economic Impact folks. I've done multiple different studies with them. So I basically applied a very similar methodology as what they applied. They look at uh, total costs uh, or potential costs. They use a, a, a what they call a, um, what's the word? It is a um, representative sample organization. So they basically model an organization that they call a composite. Um, and then they basically say, okay, if this composite organization, if this make-believe organization has a certain size and scope, what would be the business impact uh, to that organization? They look at the cost, they look at the returns, uh, they look at the risks, uh, and then they look at the cash flows associated with that. So that we did a similar thing here uh, for this particular example. Uh, and really what we, we came out with was there's kind of a few different things. One, the benefit areas that we looked at is one, the direct impact on the analysis team uh, and the, um, the, the the data science team that's working directly with the data. Uh, instead of dealing with you know local data issues, they're able to run analyses uh, much more quickly at scale across the entire country or even potentially across the entire globe if they were a global organization. Uh, and then also looked at the not only the uh, the impact to those direct folks who are able to be much more efficient with their data processing needs, but also look at the global impact of all the different um, market teams that they serve, right? Because if you're talking about a CRE organization or a retail organization, they're not just serving their immediate selves, they're serving all the teams that they would ultimately uh, be making decisions using the analysis that they're able to put together. And instead of having to, you know, do one market by market level analysis, they can actually, you know, do a, a much broader analysis much more quickly uh, and then serve that to an entire stake of, set of stakeholders to consume, uh, you know, at the point in time in which they need it, right? So it's much more about the efficiency of both the uh, individual data science or analyst teams, as well as the market teams that that's, those teams serve. Uh, so what we came up with is, um, you know, roughly a, an average three-year ROI of 199%, uh, three-year benefit of 768,000, uh, three-year cost. And this cost, by the way, takes into account uh, whereabouts compute, takes into account folks like Sean to help build the analysis, uh, takes into account education and training uh, of that, um, of that, of the of the capabilities of the system, and how to make sure that you're fully taking advantage of it, uh, and then you get a cumulative benefit um, of about 1.5 million dollars at the end of the three year period. So, just again, a summarization of like the type of uh, benefits. Just looking at two core benefit areas, we know there's more um, that you could potentially take into account. Um, you know, other cost reductions potentially with other tools that you might be able to sunset, for example, we didn't take that into account. Um, there may be greater efficiency in the way that, that we can run the analysis and whereabouts versus a different methodology uh, that, that would result in redu reduced overall compute costs uh, as an additional example. So there's a number of other factors that we couldn't take into account. We just looked at the very simple, uh, you know, productivity gains, and then ultimately the, the market team gains of being able to have access to this analysis more efficiently and ultimately make better decisions as a result of it. So that's your quick summary of the potential business, business impact uh, to those commercial real estate teams. If you need help with anything like this, we're happy to support you in doing so. This is something that I'm very comfortable with. Uh, yep. So that I was just going to ask that question mm -hmm. is um, I know a lot of people are on the data side or yeah. on the analytics side, and they've been watching this or checking these things out and saying, hey, this could really help me with my job, but mm -hmm. I need to pitch it internally to decision makers at my company. Is this something that you can um, work with them on or provide them resources to help make that pitch internally? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, again, that's something that we do very comfortably and regularly. Uh, and that's part of the reason why we put this together is, as, a, as a resource for you all. Uh, but again, it's fully customizable. We can we can look at it in the context of any organization. Uh, great. And we'll just go to the, forgot to make it slideshow, but all right. Uh, we'll just jump to the Q&A. Cool. 
So we'll we'll be happy to take any questions from folks. Um, uh, you can feel free to put them in the chat or pop them into the into the webinar uh, question and answer section of the of the of the tool. Uh, but uh, maybe we'll start with one. So you know, you you, you talked, to, for example, a little bit earlier about um, cannibalization with regards to like Starbucks and how mm. there's not really that much mm. of a cannibalization example there, um, because. Well, I mean, we just talk about that for first of all, because um, like, that's an interesting talk track about like why and and what and what scenarios would you potentially see cannibalization uh, for a co coffee shop? Yeah, so um, that one's kind of an interesting one because mm -hmm. the thing that I always hear is that um, if you're looking at a shopping center, the having coffee chains there uh, of the same chain or of even competitors uh, tends to add to business. It tends to have a um, additive effect. Uh, up until you have about three. And then after that point, they start to eat into each other's sales. Mm -hmm. So you can actually have a really relatively high tolerance for one shopping center or region to have coffee shops near each other mm. um, before you have to worry about either competition or cannibalization. Mm. Um, as far as why, I, I guess we can all make some guesses, but um, I, I suppose if there's a shopping center that you know and like, and you know that you've got a few different options to get coffee there, you're more likely to show up. I, I'm not really sure, mm. but... Um, that's that's so far what people have told me and, and what the data tends to show. Got it. Um, well, then maybe kind of carrying on with that one. So, you know, you mentioned sort of how quickly you're able to run this analysis. More about you just did it in a single notebook for a given region. In your experience, you've done this, you know, with other organizations. If you were to you know, expand this nationally or even or even in a larger region, um, what would that what would that mean from an analysis time? Like, what would that? How much longer would that take you? I mean, honestly, it'd be trivial. Um, that's the the um, sort of benefit of this notebook, and one of the reasons we want to put it together for this demo is once you have a workflow in Wearabots in a Wearabots spatial notebook, hmm. uh, you can essentially just change out the parameters and then rerun it at a larger scale or with different chains. So I could pop into that one, and I could say. Uh, I could pull the, you know, instead of doing the Texas region, uh, I could do the United States. Um, I could do different markets, uh, pull all the exact same data. I could grab different chains. I could grab Burger King and McDonald's and look at those mm -hmm. um, and then run the exact same analysis again. Um, and as far as processing time, because we're using, because we're leveraging Apache Sedona through mm -hmm. Wearabots, it, it would be pretty trivial yeah. um, as far as speed. Yeah. So we've, we've talked a little bit about this um retail cannibalization example, uh, but there's others like we, for example, we're, we're officed here in, in a place called nine zero, which is a climate tech uh, sort of co-working space in, in San Francisco. There's a lot of, there's actually a number of organizations here that work in the EV charging mm -hmm. space for electric vehicle charging. So how might we apply this uh, analysis to something like EV charging? What would, what would we think about it from a difference perspective? Yeah, that's kind of an interesting one. Um, you know, from what I understand of the EV charging landscape right now, there's so much demand for EV chargers in that people are potentially sometimes even waiting uh, to charge for other people to finish, uh, that there is no real cannibalization or uh, competition or market cannibalization happening in that space. However, you could adjust um, this notebook to look specifically at uh, site selection for EV charging. Uh, because there are things in EV charging that you'll want to look at in terms of not necessarily where competitors are. That is still a factor, I'm sure. But, um, you know, you'll want to pull in data about how many EVs, uh, electric vehicles are owned in the area. And then one thing that tends to be a big factor is uh, how many amenities are near nearby. So even with a fast charger, if you're waiting for an hour, half an hour for your car to charge, you probably don't want to just sit there in your car, right? You want to go get some groceries. You want to go get a coffee. Um, so one thing that we could do with this would be pulling in those isochrones, but instead of doing drive time, we do walk times. So you could do a five minute walk time isochrone and select locations based on, you could pull in the same POI data from Overture Maps and say, well, how many coffee shops in the area? How many you know, grocery stores? How many um, different amenities of different types? And select based on the highest number of things that people can walk to in that area. Um, so that that would certainly be a use case of site selection for EV chargers, uh, where you could do something very similar to what we're doing in this notebook. Cool. Um, we had a question in the chat as well. Thanks, Alex, for for piping in. Uh, is it is it fairly easy or is it fairly straightforward to expose model analysis results generated in whereabouts externally via API? Um, and the short answer is we have a couple of different APIs that you can leverage today, the, the Spatial SQL API, 
um, as well as the uh, Python DB API. Um, we are planning on also building out a set of um, uh, an SDK and uh, in, in JavaScript and TypeScript as well that you can build on top with. And then for, for specific types of things, um, certain types of calls uh, will we'll most likely also have REST APIs that we'll make available. So those those are things that are on our on our roadmap, uh, timing TBD <laughs> exactly as, as as roadmaps usually uh, you know have a variety variety of dependencies. But um, those are certainly things that we're both have available now in terms of those existing APIs, um, and then additional uh, capabilities coming on that front in the in the not too distant future. Is a short answer. And I've been using the uh, Python integration and and uh, Spatial SQL API quite a bit just because you know being a, a person who came up through Python, I, I love working in my local environment and have everything tuned in my VS Code environment. So I, I still want the um, processing capabilities of Whereabots uh, rather than having to actually run things on my laptop. So that that has worked really well yeah. for that. Um, and then also um, jobs is probably worth mentioning. So in yeah. Whereabots, you can create jobs uh, that will run regularly. So if you have streaming data, if you have data that's being changed regularly, you can actually build out your workflow and have it processed uh, on whatever schedule you like, and then expose that those results to um, whatever environment uh, you need to. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Airflow is the kind of common one. So a lot of orchestration happens in Airflow. So that's why we chose to support that as as part of the um, spatial SQL API sort of extended capabilities uh, initially. Uh, we're continuing to build out those capabilities within Airflow directly, um, making it you know, far easier just to, to take an existing Spark job and drop in Warbots as an alternative sort of destination for a, for a, um, a join or a particular set of, 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 of sub operations you might need to run um, and then bringing it back to wherever you ultimately need to bring it back to. So that's definitely something that we're um, encountering as a, as a consistent need within our, our user base already. Um, I was going to try and show it today, but I, I can't show it. It won't play exactly on my my laptop, the, the superset integration. So we're going to have to come back to you on that one. We are very excited about it, but we do have some capabilities with within Apache superset and DECGL specifically. So there's if you're not familiar, superset is a, basically an open source Tableau. Um, it gives you a lot of different data visualization capabilities out of the box. But then it also has a number of different plugins that you can run in, run in with it, uh, including DECGL. I'm sure there's other geospatial um, visualization capabilities, but we chose the JECGL libraries. Um, so we'll have to come back to you in a future date uh, to show what that looks like. But it's um, it's pretty it's pretty cool to be able to just visualize things really easily. Yeah, I mean, I just saw it. I, I know it's it's very new, so that's um, it was a little spotty whether we'd be able to show it or not, just right. because I believe it was this morning that we uh, got some results on that. Right. Um, but um, yeah, hopefully we'll be able to follow up with that. Um, reach out to us if you want to see it, and we can. Um, you know, connect you in some way. Uh, and then on whatever webinar comes up next, you'll probably see it. There you go. Exactly. Yeah. And we are working on other great integrations with other visualization and workflow capabilities as well outside of the ones we mentioned. So more to come on that front more broadly. And any other questions? We can take a look there and see if... Uh... I don't think we have anything else coming through. Um, so I think maybe we'll just wrap up for today. We really appreciate you all tuning in and, and hearing uh, about cannibalization and taco chains. I'm hungry now. Maybe we should go get some tacos somewhere. Sounds like a plan. <laughs> all right, great, cool. Okay, well, thanks everybody. Really appreciate you all joining today. Um, uh, feel free to reach out if you need anything from us. Uh, we're here and happy to help. Take care. Thanks for being here. Bye.